nothing and without taking away. God simply wants you to know that he loves you. He just loves you. And that is all.
freedom in this place. Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. It is your time now. Holy Spirit. It is now your time of wonders. It is now your time of wonders. It is now your time of spirit of God is not there, it's a lie. When the Lord wants to do something, he doesn't care who, what, where, and when. He doesn't care who, what, and where, and when. If he says he will do it, he will surely do it. Whether you believe it or not, he will surely do it. He will surely do it. He will do it. Anybody desperate for the touch of God? Anybody desperate for the move of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. The God of Abraham. The God of Jacob. The God of Isaac. You have never changed. speaks of a woman. You may be seated. The Bible speaks of a woman. Please pass me that flash. The Bible speaks of a woman. This woman on this day, a 
it was shown in not her day. Hallelujah. Amen. It was not her day on this day. It happened that one day, this woman's son died. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible declares that this woman had one son. Somebody say one son. One son. She had one child. And the Bible says that she was a widow, meaning her husband was dead. So her eggs were all in one basket. Please pass me my notebook. They were all in one basket. She only had one son. But on that particular day, the one son that she had died. Hallelujah. The one hope that she had, he died on that day. Now that story is only about three or four verses in the, in, in the Bible. But how, as I was reading it, I said to myself, there is something so spectacular about our God. And that I need to share the story of this woman. So we're going to open our Bibles. We'll open our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 7, verse 11. If you're not there, say, wait for me. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. I want all of us to read this scripture. The Bible reads in verse 11. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. Hallelujah. The Bible declares that Jesus went in the city called Nain. Amen. There was a large crowd that was with him. Now the reason why Jesus was going into that city, perhaps he was divinely inspired to go there. So when I said to myself, what was the significance of that city? What was the meaning of it? So I went to do some research and what I found is that it's a very small town in Galilee. Hallelujah, it's a very, very small town. A small village. It's a small village, I believe. Maybe people knew each other or knew about each other, knew each other's business. I don't know. But something that I found that was spectacular is the Bible say uh, uh, when I was doing the research, you find that the, the nine itself, the meaning of it, it means beauty or pleasantness, which also translates into pasture, a green pasture. Hallelujah. So all these things are positive attributes of that town. So I said, okay, Jesus went into this beautiful town because it had a good name. It was pleasant. However, there was something that happened in that beautiful town that day that was not so beautiful. Somebody say amen. Amen. The Bible declares in verse 12, and when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The Bible says, as Jesus was coming in, the dead man was being carried out. Are you with me? It's a city called Pleasant. But there was something that happened in that city that was not pleasant. So Jesus being God, he comes there with a solution. But unfortunately, as the bringer of the solution was coming into the town, that was a good town, 
the people of the town were going outside the town. The problem is sometimes we say that we have not felt God because we have missed him along the way. Because just as he's about to come into your life, you check out. So you miss him. Sometimes you even cross roads, but you don't know that Christ was coming in. Hallelujah. And Christ is saying tonight that stay in that beautiful town because he is coming in to get you. Stay in that pleasant place because that is where he's coming to find solution to your problem. But when you begin to pack up your stuff and to say, I'm going now, now I've had enough. That's when Jesus also gets ready and comes in. And a lot of the times is, as he comes in, it doesn't find anybody there. So he goes back. And then we say that, where is God? God, where are you? God, I've been praying. God, I can't see you. God, I've fasted. And God, I've prayed. Because we want God to work according to our time. But God is saying that my time is not your time. So you continue to pray. And you continue to wait. You continue to pray. And you continue to wait. When I am ready, I will come in the city. Amen. When I am ready, I will come. Not when you're ready. Yes. Not when you felt I've prayed enough now. Not when you felt I've fasted enough. Yes. Not when you felt about now, I should have received an answer. No. When Christ is ready, he will come and meet you at the point of your need. But all that he asks of you is that you continue praying. But for this woman, it was hard. Evangelist, the Bible says that her son was dead. Because her son was dead, he had to be carried out of the city so that he can go and get what? Buried. Get buried. She had no husband. She had one son. And that son was dead. But that one son was her destiny. Because her destiny was going to be carried through by her child. Her hope, her destiny, her grandchildren, her future depended upon that child being alive. But the son died. The Bible says in verse 12, Behold, the dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with him. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible declares that it was a large crowd that was with her. You know, sometimes when you're in a place of distress there can be people all around you but beloved you are still capable to feel alone I'm a preaching to somebody yes. although the large crowd was with her none of them were quite able to feel what she was feeling at that point they could have been encouraging her telling her it's gonna be okay it's gonna be fine but none of them had the power to bring that child back to life that was the desire of her heart. The true desire. Not the comfort. No, it's going to be okay. Because it wasn't going to be okay. Her child was dead. That is why there are times, beloved, where you are in trials and tribulations. And people, you want people to come and tell you it's going to be okay. You want people around you. But at the end of the day, those people will leave. And you find yourself by yourself. And when you're by yourself, your child is still dead. I don't know if you've ever lost somebody special to you physically. You know, there's a moment when you find out that somebody's dead and it's devastating. And then you have people come around, people come around, sorry, 
Sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss. But the most painful time for me, when I lost my granddad, was when everybody left yes. and yes. went back to their business. Yes. And everything went back to normal. But my life was not normal anymore. Because that hurt that was within me, nobody could comfort me anymore. Because everything is bound to go back to normal. Everybody is bound to go back to work. Everybody is bound to go back to school. Everybody is bound to go back to their occupation. The crowd would disappear at some point. But that woman's son would have still remained dead. Hallelujah. Am I preaching to somebody tonight? Am I preaching to somebody tonight? So then the question is, what do we do? Hallelujah. And another thing is, that son of hers was in a coffin. Hallelujah. The biggest representation of death is a coffin. Hallelujah. Amen. So any hope of that child ever surviving, the minute it was put in that coffin, it means the mother just said that it is what? It is finished for me because she decided to put all her destiny inside the coffin because according to her, there was no more hope in her destiny. There was nothing else that she could believe in because it was dead. Sometimes in life, uh, you have got your destiny that does not look fruitful today. It does not look like it's going to pick up. So you take all your hope and you put it in a coffin it's in a coffin already and that coffin simply symbolizes how faithless you have become it means that I no longer have faith that anything can happen so I take everything and I put it in a coffin, ready for burial. Beloved, sometimes we forget that the ways of God are not our ways. Sometimes we forget that the timing of God is not our time. Although to everybody around that that child was dead, but to Jesus, like that town called beautiful, that child was still alive. And he was still living. Hallelujah. Amen. And they were carrying him outside the town. Amen. When I think of that woman, Pastor, I'm reminded of the church of God as well. The church of God is now carrying a dead generation into the outside world. Somebody with me? The church of God has now given up on people so much that when things no longer work, they put them in the coffin and they go and get rid of them. Because you are no, they, there's no more hope for you. Get out. Only thing that is remaining for you is for you to be buried. Yet, that child was the image of the new generation of the church. But unfortunately, child was not in a state that the woman wanted it to be. The woman thought it's right to get rid of it. The church today, when something is not the way that we want it to be, we no longer believe in the power of resurrection. We now believe to put things into the coffin and get rid of them outside because they no longer please us. Am I preaching to somebody? Hallelujah. That has become the church of yes. God, the woman. Because she wanted her son alive. She wanted her son to be walking. She wanted her son to call her mother. She had all her hope in that child. So the minute that child refused to stay alive, she said that is it. She took the child. She put him in the coffin and she said, you need to get out of this town called beautiful because you are dead. Hey. 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 
when somebody is behaving in a way that does not please you when somebody is doing something that is no longer pleasant to you we have become the type of Christians that put people into coffins and take them out to the wild when somebody hurts you when somebody does something that does not please you they can be as good as dead to you because as far as you're concerned you are not going to put them in a place that is called beautiful at least give them a bit of hope it is time you put them in a coffin and you take them out to the world outside the gate that has become the church today where people will feel rejected by the church but when they go to the world as well they don't have hope because to the world they're dead the world can't resurrect them taking that child out of that city would not have brought it to life are you with me that boy if he had gone out of that city and not met the king of kings that would have been the end for him but thank God Jesus was along his way. Thank God that he made Jesus right along his way. As he was going out, Jesus was coming in. And Jesus had to stop them and say that stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. What is going on here? When everybody else is walking in and out of your life as they please, there is somebody that is ready to stop in your life today. Today, somebody is ready to stop in your life today. The problem is sometimes we become so depressed because whenever somebody walks in, we're just waiting for the time for them to walk out. Because people just walk in when it pleases them. When it no longer pleases them, they walk out of your life. there is somebody today that is ready to stop upon your life even though you are walking out he's telling you to come back in because he is coming in even though you are walking out he's telling you to come in because he is coming hallelujah praise the name of Jesus somebody praise the name of God Sometimes, when we say the church, we think Pastor Patrick, Evangelist Nyari, Pastor Sylvie, Elder Notando, maybe Elder Nicole, maybe Dick. No. Somebody say no. No. Somebody say no. no. Say no louder. No. <laughs> Straight away, when we think the church of God, we think, ah, oh, the leaders of the church. That is where we're wrong. Each and every person in this place is the church of God. Amen. It's not about the building. It's not about who stands here and preach. It's not about who stands there and pray for people. Do you not know that the church is like a body? Can the head move? If the head does not have a brain, can the brain function if it does not have a heart? But the easiest thing to do sometimes as a church, we point at the head. We point at the leaders and we point at that. When something's not working, we do not feel that burden Amen. for people. Amen. We do not feel that burden because we think that we come to the church. But when we refer to the church, we're just referring to the leaders of the church. We are not referring to the leaders because, beloved, when Christ comes, he's not going to say, Pastor this or Elder this. He will know you by your name and he will ask you, what did you do about my people? And we better have answers. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say, I am the church of God. Somebody say loud, I am the church of God. What do you do to preserve the church of God? What do you do when a situation in the church looks dead? What do you do when a brother or a sister 
comes to you with a situation and beloved it looks so hopeless it looks so hopeless just as hopeless as rain is able to come down in a desert it looks like there is no solution do you put them in their coffin and take them out or do you call upon the master of resurrection to come and begin to resurrect do you kick them out or do you call upon the god of resurrection to begin to operate resurrection 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 praise god there is things that we have within the church. Beloved, the Bible declares that that woman was a widow. Praise God. She was a widow. It means her husband was dead. But then Jesus came in. <laughs> Jesus came in. Somebody praise God. Jesus came in. Amen. It doesn't matter that, she, that, that her husband was dead. Hallelujah. There was a divine husband that was sent to be able to come and operate resurrection upon her life that day. Hallelujah. She was a widow, but Jesus is the husband to the widows. He is the husband to the widows. Beloved, Jesus is the husband to the widows. Even though her husband was dead, but Jesus came to stand in the place and say that, do not worry about that physical man, but come here and go into the place because I, Jesus, I have the power of resurrection that your husband does not have. You can pray. Your husband cannot come and bring this child back to life. A husband would not have brought a child back to life. But Jesus, Jesus was going to bring that child back to life. That day she would have never expected those events to turn out like that. Never. We too do the same, beloved. Are we not the spouse of Christ? Am I preaching to somebody? Am I preaching from the same gospel you read? Elder, are we not the spouse of Christ? Yes, we are. We are. So when things are not working, why do we rid of it? Instead of calling the master. Instead of going to cry to our husband and say that Jesus, my husband, we come as a church and we pray to you to bring resurrection in this dead situation. But that never occurs to us. Because this is how things happen. Today, you can be the church of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The representation of the woman. Although you are alive and you are well, and there's somebody that is being put into the coffin, and you as well are participating to putting that person in the coffin. Tomorrow, you can be that dead man <laughs> in that coffin. Somebody praise God. Amen. Because you see, the dead woman, uh, the, the, the woman, the mother could still talk, right? She could still walk. She could still ask for help. But beloved, the person in that coffin could not do anything. He was completely dependent upon that woman or maybe by chance the people around her. Because he could not ask for himself. Because it was already declared dead. It was declared finished. So he depended upon the prayers of other people. Praise God. Amen. So today you have a voice, beloved. Yes. Then do with your voice what you would like people to do for you when you do not have a voice. Somebody praise God. Amen. Today you can pray and pray and pray. That's fine. But you when you pray it's just for me myself and i 
Someone around you's life is not working, but it's just for me, me. What about me? It's not working for me. When you is no longer there, you will not pray for yourself. You will depend upon he and she and them and that person's prayer, not me's prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But then I also said that that woman, her child, was supposed to be the new generation. Hallelujah. Because the Bible declares in verse 14 at the end that Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The key in that verse is young man. Are you with me? The key in that verse is young man, I say to you, arise. It means that that boy was the younger representation of that woman. That boy was the newer generation of that old lady. But that young man was dead. He was dead. Fathers and mothers. We need you in order for our generation to even have a chance. Praise God. Because the devil knew that that young man was stronger. That young man, he was newer. That young man was a newer generation. So in order to suffocate the future, the devil decided, I am not going to kill the mother. I am going to kill the child. Because that child was the destiny of the woman. Because maybe that woman was old and maybe she was ready to die. And that person got any business with that. He already killed the husband. This already hurt her. Are you with me? He already caused the pain. But killing that young man, killing that young man was not just going to affect just just herself it was going to affect anything that he was supposed to do are you with me it was even going to affect the children of that young man because the husband was already dead are you with me beloved but the good thing is as they were going out jesus was coming That was the good thing about that city that day. Praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody praise God. Amen. Somebody praise God even more. Amen. Somebody praise God. Amen. The Bible declares in verse 13. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Somebody read it with me. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on that. She was not dead. If there was somebody that the Lord would have had compassion on, would have been the person lying there dead. Praise God. Yeah. Is it not true? Yes, she was weeping, but at least she was crying alive. The person in that coffin was dead. But beloved, the Lord has compassion upon his church. The Lord always finds compassion upon his church. Even when we do things that do not please God, but because of the love that he has for his church, because of the love that he has for his church, because of that love, it will change everything. Although you do things that do not please God, although God might not be happy with you, but because of the compassion that he has for the church, that he would even die for the church and accept the shame for death at the cross, he had to stop. He loves the church so much. Beloved, God loves you so much because you are a part of this church of God. So that even when you are faithless, He remains faithful. Even when you no longer have hope, He is the hope of glory. Even when you 
was scared. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Jesus stopped because he had compassion on her. Now the, the thing is, in order for Jesus to have compassion on you, you must be identified within the church. Are you with me? I'm not talking about your today, you're here, you're present, you're sitting down. No. I'm talking about truly belonging to the body of Christ. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And that goes beyond, yes, I, I give my life to God, I accept, it goes beyond that. A lot of the times is God is coming in the church to operate wonders, but the, the, he wants to operate wonders upon the people that are actually part of the body of Christ, that are actually part of the church. So for anybody who's like, I'm here, but I don't want to be here, or I'm here and I'm also there, it doesn't work. Because then we end up missing the touch of God. Because God is ready to save his church and to protect his church. And it is our job for those of us that are present and are truly here to make sure we drag everybody in so that everybody can also be part of this body so that when Jesus is ready to come in, he finds all of us ready to be able to receive the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say bigger amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 14. Then he came and touched the open coffin. Somebody say the open coffin. The coffin was open. Are you with me? Amen. I started by telling you that upon my research, I discovered that this town was a very small town whereby possibly people knew each other. Hallelujah. Amen. That coffin being opened meant that everybody knew that that woman's only son was dead. Are you with me? Because it was open for the world to see that that woman's only hope is now lying down in that open coffin, dead. Sometimes situations come into our lives and we find that our lives are now exposed to the world whether we decide to expose them ourselves or whether it just happens that because of the circumstances and because it is a small place everybody knows your problem everybody knows your situation everybody can identify that that person is this woman's son because the coffin was open praise God Amen. praise God Amen. But sometimes that's not always a bad thing. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. God wants to see that your destiny is in a coffin and the coffin is open. He wants the world to know your business. He wants the world to know that this person doesn't have money. Praise God. Amen. This person doesn't even have five pounds to buy gas. You see this person, you know why they walk today? Because their car is not working. Praise God. Amen. You see this person, she's had that hair for a month. Because she's got, she has about 40 pounds to go and get brand new weave to do her hair. Real talk. And everybody knows your business. You see that woman, she has three colors of dresses. 
She has a pink one, a green one, and a black one. So she'll wear the pink one, the green one, and the black one, and then she'll rotate it. And then she'll wear the black one, the pink one, and the green one, and then she'll wear the pink, she will rotate it because that's all that she has. Everybody knows you because of your problem and your situation. Praise God. Why? Because not just that you were in, it's bad enough that you were in the coffin or your destiny is in that coffin, but that coffin is also remaining open. Praise God. But then something happened. Somebody says something happened. We're reading verse 14. It says, And those who carried them stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If we read the beginning of verse 14, it says, Then he came and touched the open coffin. Hallelujah. The Bible says that he did not come and touch the dead man. He came and he touched the what? The open coffin. I said, God, if you were trying to operate resurrection, why did you not just touch the person who was what? Dead. Does that make, doesn't that make more sense? But beloved, the characteristic of that man was now characterized by his presence within the coffin. Praise God. So him identifying the coffin was now an identification that this person is dead. Hallelujah. So Jesus needed to be able to touch the situation. When he would touch the situation, he would resurrect the man. Because he was now the representation of that coffin. Because that is where the world put him. So he needed to be separated from death. In order for him to be separated from death, resurrection was surely going to happen. But Jesus needed to touch the coffin to be like, hey, you and this coffin are not one. You are a coffin and this is a man. You are a coffin for dead people and this man is alive. So him touching the coffin was saying that let us separate what is dead and from what is alive. A lot of the time is that God has resurrected you, but you are still connected to the coffin. It's, it, it's now become my problem, my sickness, my this and my that. But Jesus is not just here to touch you. Is also here to touch that sickness so that that sickness can know that in this body there is no place for you. Is here to touch that depression so that depression can know that in this body there is no depression. Is here to touch that spirit of brokenness so that that spirit of brokenness can know that in this body there is no brokenness. Is here to touch that faithless spirit so that you can know. You, you want to stay in the coffin. But God is not just here to resurrect you. He's here to touch that coffin. So you know that, hey, it's time for separation. Papa Pascal once preached to us. And I love that verse so much. That you must separate the precious from the vow. Yes. And you shall not go to them, but they will come to you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You shall separate what is darkness from what is light. It shall not, you shall not go to them, but it shall come to you. We are not of the people that go out begging. We are not of the people that go out seeking for whatever. But it's time for people to start coming to you. It's time for people to start getting interested in your life. Somebody praise the name of Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Because the Bible declares, the minute Jesus touched the coffin, the man woke up. Amen. Jesus touched the coffin, the man rose up. And what did the man begin to do as soon as he rose up? Read your Bible. What did he do? What did he do? He spoke. He spoke. The Bible is not quite clear on what he said, but I believe that he began to praise the name of Jesus. I believe that he began to worship the name of God. I believe that he began to say that I am alive. Am I alive? I feel alive. I feel that I'm alive. I'm alive. The coffin. Hallelujah. The reason sometimes that our deliverance is not coming so quick, we are so attached, so attached to that death, so attached to our coffin, so attached to everything that we've been putting. But today, God is ready to touch it. I said, Hey, it's time to go. Hey, it's time to go. Hey, it is time to go. It is time to go. It's time to go. Somebody say it's time to go. Say it louder. It's time to go. It is time to go. It is time to go. How can it be that God touches you? But you still refuse to speak. How can it be that God took you out of death? You still refuse to even put your hand up and say, Glory to God. Do you want to know why? still remain attached to your coffin. Jesus did not tell that young man to speak. Jesus had already done his part. He came with the power of resurrection. Jesus comes to resurrect you. To restore you, to do something in you, yet you still refuse to speak. Even simple, amen. You can't say amen. And then Jesus comes in and he comes out. Resurrection is there, but you refuse to still be attached to your coffin. Other people are rising from their coffins. And when I say rising from the coffin, we must think of this woman now. Her hope was restored. Beloved, her destiny was alive. Her destiny was resurrected. Her destiny was lived. So, if you did not catch anything that I said today, but I want you to remember this. God still has compassion upon his church. God is still ready to have compassion upon you. God is still ready to come and deliver you from the spirit of death. God is still ready to come and help you to feel alive again today. So God is saying, it is time for you to come out of your body and to go into the spirit. When your body is tired, your body is tired, your spirit is tired, your soul is tired, you say that now, now is the time. Somebody say after me.
Crying unto 
of your children's life. Father, we need resurrection. Father, we want the church that shall not keep quiet, but the church that shall talk, that shall speak, and that shall testify and pray for church Jehovah. We thank you, O Father, and we thank you, God, to be doers of this word of Jehovah and not only hearers, Father. We bring the church into your heart, to a holy throne, that you may place us, O God, and we pray that, O God, that this word shall be sealed upon our hearts according to what the God has spoken to us this afternoon and the whole church says hallelujah